Good morning and welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church in Poughkeepsie, New York and our virtual worship series. This video is for Sunday morning, October 4th, 2020, which is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. We hope that you're staying safe and healthy in the midst of this fall season, and we appreciate you tuning in this morning. In the meantime, let's frame our hearts and minds before God as we prepare to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy, and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting in Christ's great promise of forgiveness, let us now turn our hearts toward God in a moment of humble confession. Eternal God, our Creator, you are our breath and our very life. We are the work of your hands, the children of your creation. We confess that we have often turned from you and sought our own path through life. Forgive us our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, that you may be our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, who is so rich in mercy, loved us even while we were still far away and has given us new life through our Lord Jesus Christ. By grace you have been saved, and in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God now forgives you all your sins. Amen. So now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now the epistle reading from Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that if I already have obtained all of this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the people, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they said to him, 
He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When you read today's parable at first glance, it seems like such an outrageous string of events. It, it makes Jesus' other hyperbole seem kind of tame, actually. I mean, who does this, this sort of thing um, that he outlines? Well, actually, there are people who do this sort of thing, and there were. So, for instance, in the 1700s and 1800s, um, on Prince Edward Island in particular, there were absentee landowners who owned each of the provinces that the government had created on the island. And I think there were like 67 provinces on the island. And these absentee landlords owned these government created provinces. But those landlords had often not fulfilled the terms of their contracts. And in more than that, they were oppressing the settlers who were doing all the farming and development on the island. And so when the settlers who were doing all the work tried to enforce the contracts, and in cases change ownership to them, they discovered that most of the landlords had close government connections, and there was very little progress, and even more oppression from, you know, as retaliation for a very long time. And as I was researching, I also discovered that in at least one province um, over in, in Pakistan, I think it is, uh, landowners, even to this day, often exploit their workers in some very nasty ways. And even now, retaliatory violence and killings are part of the negotiation process. It's really more like an intimidation process. So this is going on in our world now. And uh, imagine it was more popular in those days. So today's parable it actually wouldn't have been so outrageous. It would have been a familiar scenario to the Pharisees and to everyone who was hearing Jesus teach on this gospel day. So here he is describing settlers and sharecroppers who've been doing all the work and getting no credit from the owner who has been nowhere to be seen and maybe even never fulfilled the terms of their contract. And the workers feel there has been injustice. And so they retaliate and they eventually kill the people along the way, eventually kill the owner's son in a last ditch attempt to intimidate their way into ownership. So the Pharisees heard this, understood this, related to it, and knew the answer to Jesus' question. And so do we. I mean, the particular scenario is kind of easy to see. But is it so easy to see in today's vineyard? Um, what is your vineyard? And is there any place in, in your life where God might seem to be your absentee landlord? I don't know, like all those times when, when God seems to be gone, when God seems to be not listening, um, not reacting, when maybe you think God isn't caring, like especially maybe now uh, during this pandemic. And yet that same distant non-interacting God keeps making more demands of us to be better, more loving, more perfect, more patient, to rise above, to take the high road, but the high road is too steep and it gets hard to keep up with all the expectations, especially in the face of a society that seems to be more divided than ever. In moments like that, do you ever resent what God is asking of you? You know, but 
I mean, okay, so let's put all the all the craziness of the virus and the political environment. Let's put all that aside. Overall, things are really going pretty well in this world, and we enjoy a particularly unique level of success and comfort and luxury, especially here uh, in our in our country. And so over time, as we keep accomplishing things and getting better and better and richer and richer and and more and more sophisticated, um, and God doesn't seem to be interfering or interacting. So is it such a reach to say that eventually the world might begin to feel like, yeah, we've really done this ourselves. And because we are the ones doing all the work and creating all of this, eventually um, would it be so much of a reach to think that we might even begin to feel a sense of ownership and entitlement to what we've accomplished? And then add to that, you know, you don't go for a, to church for a while because of the pandemic and, and, and you don't get struck by lightning. And um, you may begin to feel like, well, maybe it's OK to just stay home, put my feet up and, and, and watch the worship service with coffee and my socks on, you know. Or maybe you don't need church at all anymore because maybe God doesn't care. Maybe some people think maybe God isn't even necessary. And then suddenly, you know, just like that, we have as a collective world, like the workers in the field, taken things into our own hands. And that's where Jesus is warning us in this gospel that, that just maybe in God's, you know, apparent absence, maybe we've forgotten our original purpose which is easy to do if God leaves you to your own devices for any length of time, right? But if we lapse into believing that it is all ours, our effort, our money, our success, our world, then we may find that just like the tenants in the parable, we're in danger of throwing God's son out of his own vineyard. Hey, it happened once. Will we do it again? See, Jesus makes it clear, you know, the vineyard and the kingdom is going to be taken away from those who claim false ownership of the fruits that they produce and given to someone else, to someone who remembers whose stuff it really is that we're playing with here. But what stuff are we playing with here? And when God does come back to retrieve the fruits that are his, what exactly are afraid are we afraid of? Um, are we afraid that, like in the parable, God is going to take everything that's His? Well, which is technically everything, right? But what exactly will God take? What is God after? Is is God going to take our house, our 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 building, our money, and leave nothing? Well, the ironic thing is. Um, God doesn't care about any of that stuff. See, God doesn't want our multitude. God wants our attitude. The fruits of the vineyard that God wants, the fruits you are called to produce, they're not power and control and riches and status and ownership and entitlement. And you know, God wants to collect from you the fruits of the Spirit. You know, things like compassion, justice, mercy, faith, hope, and love, kindness, generosity. That was our purpose. That's supposed to be the fruit of the vineyard of our life. Is that what we're producing enough of? Is that what you produce? Hey, anyway, like, you know what? If that's all that God ultimately wants from you, <laughs> Why wouldn't you give it all to him? You really have anything to lose? In any way, the more fruit of the Spirit that you give away, the more you have. And so if we're willing to part with, you know, our possessions and our money and our time and our talents and all those things, and we give them to God, that's all part of the fruit of the Spirit. So, you know, the truth is, look at this parable. You could ignore God all you want. It doesn't matter. This will never be our vineyard. This will never be our church because all the fruits really belong to God. 
no matter what we may think. But the good news is that despite the intimidation you know, of the world, despite the intimidation of the Pharisees in those days, despite the intimidation of the crucifixion, despite the in intimidation of a seemingly uncaring and divided world today, God will not capitulate. God did not give up on Maundy Thursday, and neither will God give up now. That is so awesome. So get out into that field and produce as much spiritual fruit as you can for God's sake. Personally, I can hardly wait for that harvest. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now we'll give to God the fruit of our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now with confidence in God's grace and mercy, let's take a moment to pray for the church, for the world, and for all who are in any kind of need. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your true life, that we may bear your fruit through our work and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today, as we celebrate Udugu Sunday with our connection to the Kishura Parish in Bukoba, Tanzania, our sister synod, let us remember to pray for each other as we have in the past, asking God to lead our way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the abundant harvest of the earth. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables. Bless the flowers that are placed in the chancel today to the glory of God and re remembrance of Brent Thompson's brother, Brian Thompson, on the 11th anniversary of his passing by Brent and Patty Thompson. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life. Assured of your presence, heal our pain and our suffering. We call to mind those who are struggling today, especially Kathleen Wirth, Joseph Camacho, Susan Pike, Jim Frick, and all those whose names we lift up to you now, either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all managers in our community and all who seek employment. Give hope and a future to those who lack meaningful work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the saints who have taught us to live faithfully in your vineyard. We remember especially today Robert Hart, the stepfather of Brent Thompson, who passed away this week. May our chorus join his and theirs until our labor is complete. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold into your loving arms all for whom we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Take a moment to share the peace with the people in the room with you right now, uh, make a call, send a text. Let somebody else know that the peace of God rests with them as well. And now, one more prayer before we go. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer all darkness, and you sent the bread of heaven to nourish all your people. Send us forth today with the healing power of the gift of our very life, that we may serve you more fully by loving our neighbors more deeply through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon each one of you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. And remember, you are the body of Christ raised up for the world. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being with us this week. And we look forward to seeing you either in church or on video next week. Yeah.